Everything we do is focused on cultivating an appetite for a deeper understanding of the Bible. It's my desire to teach the Bible with clarity and relevance so that unbelievers might be converted, believers will be established, and local churches strengthened. We dive into the Word of God, presenting relevant and practical truths for everyday life. Find a full program schedule at kneo.org. One of the great events of the end times is an invasion of Israel by a vast horde of nations from every direction. This invasion, which is known as the Battle of Gog and Magog, is graphically described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Taken literally, it predicts a last day's invasion of Israel from every direction by a coalition of nations and God's direct supernatural intervention to annihilate the invaders. Events in our world today strikingly foreshadow this coming invasion. The prophecy of the Battle of Gog and Magog begins with a list of ten proper names in, in Ezekiel 38, 1-6. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, Persia, Ethiopia, and Put with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer with all his troops, Bethogarma from the remote parts of the north with all his troops, many peoples with you. The name Gog, which occurs 11 times in Ezekiel 38 and 39, is a name or the title of the leader of this invasion. It's clear that Gog is an individual since he's directly addressed several times by God and since he's called a prince. The other nine proper names in Ezekiel 38, 1 through 6 are specific geographical locations. Now, none of the place names in Ezekiel 38, 1-6 exist on any modern map. Ezekiel used the ancient place names that were familiar to the people of his day. Uh, but we can correlate them with modern nations. Uh, Magog is Central Asia. Uh, Rosh is Russia. Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Tagarma are all modern-day Turkey. Persia is Iran. Uh, Ethiopia, or actually Kush, is Sudan. And ancient Put is Libya. Based on these identifications, Ezekiel 38 and 39 predicts an invasion of the land of Israel in the last days by a vast confederation of nations from north of the Black and Caspian Seas, extending down to modern Iran in the east, as far as modern Libya to the west, and down to Sudan in the south. Therefore, Russia will have at least five key allies, Turkey, Iran, Libya, Sudan, and the Central Asian Islamic nations of the former Soviet Union. Amazingly, all of these nations are Muslim, and Iran, Libya, and Sudan are three of Israel's most ardent opponents. Many of these nations are hotbeds of militant Islam and are either forming or strengthening their ties with each other. Now, this list of nations reads like the who's who of this week's newspaper. It does not require a, a very active imagination to envision these nations openly challenging the West and conspiring together to invade Israel in the near future. And the prophet Ezekiel predicted all of this over 2,500 years ago. This is another powerful confirmation of the divine inspiration of the Bible. Ezekiel 38 tells us that this invasion will occur in the last days when Israel has been regathered to her land and is living in peace and safety. There's only one period in the future, according to Scripture, that clearly fits this description of Ezekiel, and that is the first half of the coming seven-year tribulation, when Israel will be living under its peace agreement with the Antichrist. Under that covenant, Israel will be able to, re to relax because her Gentile enemies will, be, will have become her friends, apparently uh, guaranteeing her borders and promising her peace. Therefore, it seems clear that the battle will come when Israel has been lulled into the false sense of, uh, of a security agreement signed by the leader of the revived Roman Empire. With these international guarantees, Israel will turn her energies toward increased wealth rather than defense, only to have the peace treaty shattered by a massive surprise attack. Events in our world today indicate that the great battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the coming Middle East war, could be very near. All of the necessary antecedents for the fulfillment of this prophecy are in place or are moving in that direction. 
The Jewish people have been regathered to their land. The Middle East peace process is front and center in international diplomacy. And the invaders in Ezekiel 38 are identifiable nations who are forming alliances with one another and have both the desire and the potential to fulfill the Gog prophecy. The remarkable correspondence between world events and what Ezekiel predicted is another indication that the coming of the Lord could be very soon. Mark Hitchcock is a fascinating man. He's the author of uh, nearly 20 books related to end-time Bible prophecy, including the best-selling 2012, The Bible and the End of the World. Uh, he has a Master of Theology and also a Ph.D. from Dallas Theological Seminary, and he serves as senior pastor in a church in Oklahoma, and he's also adjunct professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And on top of all of that, he holds a law degree. What did you get first, Mark? The law degree or the, or, or the theology degrees? The law degree. Yeah, I was a lawyer and then I was for four years and then, then went to Dallas Seminary after that. Now, why? I mean, you're you just established in law and then you decide you want to study theology? Well, some say I repented of being a lawyer, you know, of, the, of that and went to seminary. But no, I, uh, I was a lawyer for four years. And uh, really, when I started into law school and during that time, I really hadn't been seeking the Lord's guidance really in my life, just kind of doing what seemed best to me. And um, I began to be able to teach uh, different classes at our church, start with junior high boys and began to uh, do some adult classes, just began to study the Bible, and that just really began to take over my life. So I just began to pray about that, and uh, the Lord led, led me and my wife uh, down to Dallas Seminary. And uh, just, you know, I've never looked back from that point on. Now, you're going to be our Truth to Go teacher for, for the month of June, uh, and we're looking forward to your segments. But, and we're going to be talking, featuring, in fact, this book, uh, the Amazing Claims of Bible Prophecy, What You Need to Know in These Uncertain Times. Um, but before we talk about that, what about 2012, The Bible and the End of the World? Um, I haven't read the book. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it selling well? It, it has been, right. It's been selling very and, well. And just, just give us a quick summary of why there's all this fascination about 2012. Well, it, it really goes back to the Mayan calendar. You know, the Mayans uh, were a, a people who lived down in Mesoamerica. They knew a tremendous amount about astrology, astronomy, uh, mathematics, and their calendar ends, their long count calendar, they had several of them, ends on December uh, the 21st of 2012, the winter solstice. Right. And so because of that, many believe that the world's going to end at that time, or maybe there's going to be some great new beginning that's going to take place. Right. And uh, basically what I do in the book is kind of debunk that whole idea. Right. I look at what the Mayans say, Nostradamus, all the different things that people use, kind of debunk those, and then show how the Bible's the only really reliable source, and then talk about what the Bible says is yeah. going to happen. Because there's, I, I mean, I, I fly a lot, and I'm, I, I go through bookstores and airports, and I, I, I see these books on 2012, mm -hmm. and yes. I think it's, it's almost becoming a, a, a movement. It had, you know? Oh, it is. I mean, people are as almost paranoid about 2012 as they were about uh, the dawning of the, uh, the new millennium. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. Uh, but uh, I, uh, that's interesting. I've got, I got to read that. Well, they call, it, they call that the real Y2K. A lot of them are calling <laughs> the that real or, Y2K. Yeah, the, the Mayan Y2K. The Mayan Y2K. They're calling it, so, yeah. Well, I'm glad you've written about that. Um, before, I, I want to focus in on just a couple of the chapters in this book, because we certainly can't cover it all in a few minutes. But before doing that, prophecy can be so, so subjective mm -hmm. in its interpretation. Uh, you know, I, I've been in the ministry for 40 years, and I, I pastored in Jerusalem, as you know, for seven years, and uh, I heard every end-time scenario from <laughs> every wacko in Christendom to the point where uh, I really wrestle with cynicism when it comes to anybody who purports to expose the meaning of the prophetic passages of the mm -hmm. Old Testament. Having said that, as a kind of a personal disclaimer, why prophecy? Why are you so fascinated with this? And how is it that you've managed, as, as I've read your book, to come up with such a reasonable <laughs> approach? It just is so refreshing. Well, you know, Bible prophecy, I think, is important for several reasons. One, one very um, obvious reason, 28% of the Bible was prophetic at the time it was written. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always tell people when they ask me, why do you love Bible prophecy? I love the Bible. So to me, if you love the Bible, you're going to love Bible prophecy. And I think if we don't know how to interpret, at least have some basic idea of how to interpret this, the Bible is going to kind of be a closed book to us, or large parts of it. We're just not going to understand it. But the other thing I think that's very practical to me is, you know, prophecy, I think understood correctly, is one of the, the most powerful motivating factors to live for the Lord uh, that we have in the Bible. 
Because if we really believe that perhaps today, you know, perhaps today could be the day that Jesus comes back, it's going to change the way a person lives. And that's the way it's, it's given to us uh, in the New Testament. But I think when it comes to interpreting prophecy, there are a lot of different views and, uh, out there. There's there certain non-negotiables, you know. To me, if you're a Christian, we believe in the, the return of Christ, literally, mm -hmm. physically. We believe in a resurrection of the dead, and we believe in a retribution or a final judgment. Those are the non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. Now, the other things... You know, we, we want to try to understand the best we can. And I just think if we apply a consistent, normal, or plain hermeneutic or understanding or interpretation of the Bible, I think we can understand a lot of what God is telling us about the future. Now, I, it would be fascinating to get into what you write about uh, the prophet Daniel. And uh, also, you have real expertise in the book of Revelation. Uh, you did your doctorate uh, on, did. on Revelation, which I think has got to be an awesome task. But... Uh, Let's talk about uh, chapter 7 and 8, really, is where you deal with, um, with Jesus. Mm -hmm. In 7, you talk about the Bethlehem prophecies, and in 8, you talk about the shadow of the cross. Um, in Micah, we read this, As for you, Bethlehem Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. You see that as a distinct prophecy with regard to Jesus being born in Bethlehem. That's right, yeah. And, you know, that's an amazing prophecy, too, because it says that he's the one whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting, who's going to be born. So, I mean, this pictures the eternal one stepping out of eternity into time to be born. And, of course, what's fascinating is when you get to Matthew uh, chapter 2, when uh, the wise men come to Jerusalem and they ask, you know, the scribes there, Herod calls them in and says, where's the Messiah going to be born? They don't have to, you know, go look around for it. They immediately say he's going to be born in Bethlehem. They quote Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And this is a prophecy written 700 years before Messiah was born. And it doesn't just say that he'd be born in Bethlehem because there was actually another Bethlehem up north. But this was uh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, which was the Bethlehem down in, in the south, down in the area of Judea, which is so specific. Of course, it was just a small little insignificant village at that time, but it said that he would be born there. And, of course, it took a worldwide census to get Joseph and Mary to come down there for Jesus to be born in that exact place. And yeah. so, what, you know, these, these prophecies are, they're, they truly are amazing, astonishing prophecies. Yeah. And, you know, in my years in Jerusalem, I, I discussed a lot of these prophecies with uh, Jewish friends of mine, some of them rabbis. And, you know, you come to a sentence like this from, from their Bible, mm -hmm. from Micah, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Yes. Very difficult, uh, you know, for, for uh, a lot of my Jewish friends to conceive of um, a Messiah who comes, if you will, from the days of eternity. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to apply that in space and time. The Christian uh, interpretation or hermeneutic is that this is Jesus fully God and fully man. And that explains how this Messiah can come from eternity. That's right, because we have a, a Trinitarian view of God where they have a Unitarian mm -hmm. view of God, mm -hmm. really. You know, and God is one. Mm -hmm. uh, it says in the Old Testament, yeah. we believe that as well, he, but he's one in essence. Um, he's one in substance, but he's three in person. And that's, that's where the issue comes in. That's where the issue comes in, you know, with Islam and where they don't believe that Jesus is, is truly God, that he's very God, a very God, and very man, a very man. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's where the real difference really lies. It, it's all, in fact, we, we would say, I think, in, in, as, as Christians, that really that is the ultimate issue, is, is the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we're followers of Christ. We're Christians yeah. because of what we believe about him. Now, here's, here's a prophecy from Isaiah 7 that uh, is a struggle for a lot of uh, Christians who are from a liberal perspective. Mm -hmm. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, uh, there are a number of church leaders uh, who uh, say, come on now, um, surely um, Jesus couldn't have been born of a virgin. Mm -hmm. He had to have a father. And this concept of an immaculate conception is just a bit much. Mm -hmm. well, what's your comment? Well, you know, a lot of people come to the Bible, and nowadays especially with, a, with an anti-supernatural bias. 
So anything that's supernatural can't be true, and so they have to find a naturalistic explanation for that. And people will say, well, you know, you, obviously you can't have a virgin birth. Well, people knew that back then, too. You know, it's yeah. not like people back then didn't know the facts of life. Right. I mean, that's the whole point. It's a miracle. Mm -hmm. And obviously for Jesus uh, coming into the world to be God, but also to be man, but to not have a, the original sin, he was born of the woman without a human father. And so in that way, he can be God, but he can also be man. But he was unfallen man, sinless man. And, uh, you know, that's the miracle of the person of Jesus Christ. And really, to me, it all goes back to your whole world view. You know, if you go all the way back and you believe that there's a God who made everything, who created everything that exists out of nothing, then these other lesser miracles really are no stumbling block mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. A professor at a liberal theological seminary was teaching from the book of Daniel. At the beginning of one of his lectures, he said, Now I want you to know that Daniel was written during the Maccabean period in the second century BC. The facts were written as all history is after the events took place. One young man raised his hand and asked, How can that be, sir, when Christ said in Matthew 24 15 that it was written by Daniel? The professor paused for a moment, looked the student square in the eyes, and said, Young man, I know more about the book of Daniel than Jesus did. Now, this is what goes on in many seminaries across our world every day, and sadly, many students from that seminary are preaching in churches today. And this story highlights what liberal critics have attempted to do to Bible prophecy, especially the book of Daniel, and even more specifically to Daniel chapter 11. This chapter is so intricately detailed that most scholars reject it as impossible. Daniel 11 is the most specific, detailed prophecy in the Bible, so it's not surprising that it has drawn the sharpest criticism. Many skeptics who deny or diminish God's Word don't want to admit that detailed prophecies like this are even possible. They maintain that nobody could write such detailed information about so many people and events before they happened. For these critics, Daniel 11 must have been written in the second century B.C. by someone other than Daniel after these events had already occurred. For this reason, Daniel 11 has been appropriately called the battleground of Daniel. It's here that worldviews collide and theological presuppositions clash. The Bible records history before it happens. Prophecy is history written in advance. Nowhere is this more evident than in Daniel 11, 1 to 35. Bible teacher John Phillips says this about Daniel 11. When Daniel 11 was written, they were not written as history but prophecy. We see them as history. Daniel saw them still ahead in the unborn ages. No other chapter in all of Scripture gives us such an exhibition of God's power to foretell the future. And I agree. The prophecy begins in Daniel's day when the Persian Empire was still in power and looks forward from that point to the Greek conquest and beyond, meticulously recording history in advance. These 35 verses are an extraordinarily detailed preview of world history. This section chronicles the 150-year struggle, the back and forth, the give and the take between uh, the, the Ptolemaic or Egyptian dynasty and the Seleucid or Syrian dynasty in the 3rd and 2nd centuries B.C. Of course, the nation caught in the middle of this power struggle was Israel, which is God's focus in all of this. 
According to scholars, there are at least 100 prophecies and possibly as many as 135 in Daniel 11, 1 through 35, that have been fulfilled and can be corroborated by a careful study of history. I think you can certainly see why so many critics with an anti-supernatural bias reject this chapter as a second century forgery and fraud written after these events already occurred rather than as a divine prophecy written in advance. It just seems too unbelievable for them. But I believe God can tell the future and this chapter is conclusive proof of his omniscience. The question ultimately revolves around one key and very simple issue. Can God predict future events? If he can, then the amount of detail in a particular prophecy is no problem. When you stop and think about it, it all really goes back to an even more basic issue. If you believe that God created the world, then accurately predicting a small slice of history is not really a big deal for God. That's where it all really starts. Daniel 11, 1 to 35 is critical to our understanding and interpretation of biblical prophecy. Looking back in history, we can confirm that these prophecies were completely, literally fulfilled. It just makes sense that if the prophecies in Daniel 11, 1 to 35 were literally fulfilled down to the last detail, then we can rest assured that the prophecies recorded in Daniel and elsewhere in the Bible that are still future in our day will also be completely, literally fulfilled as well. Now, that's the right kind of amillennials, because there is a millennium coming someday, and Christ is going to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords, and that is what we're looking for. And Jesus Christ uh, is in control. Now, what should we do in times like these in which we live? You know, we often hear people say, God bless America. Well, we have to be blessable, don't we? I mean, you can throw that around, you're God bless America, but we have to be blessable. We have to do the things that God has called upon nations to do. Um, in order to be blessed and to experience his blessing. I've got a little segment here I want to share with you called Biblical Civics 101. This is three keys to America continuing to experience national blessing. There's what we might call God's foreign policy and God's domestic policy. And it's laid out uh, very clearly for us uh, in the Bible. The first key, key number one, is blessing the Jewish people. This is the primary foreign policy statement that God has in the Bible, isn't it? I will bless those that bless you. And this is actually the way it is in Hebrew. It's I will bless those that bless you, and the one who curses you, I must curse. We have seen that principle verified in history over and over again, haven't we? Think about Pharaoh. Think about Haman in the book of Esther. Think about Antiochus Epiphanes. Think about Hitler. In fact, someone has said that every time someone comes and tries to wipe out the Jewish people, they end up with a holiday based on that or a festival. I mean, you know, Pharaoh, they get Passover. With Haman, they get Purim. Uh, with Antiochus, they get Hanukkah or Feast of Lights. I guess Hitler's the only one that doesn't fit into that. But that, is God's, that has been God's uh, M.O. throughout history, that those who bless the Jewish people have been blessed and those uh, who curse them have been cursed. And God is not through with the Jewish people. And therefore, he carefully watches to see how individuals and how nations uh, treat them today. And so far, the United States of America has received good marks on God's report card about how we've dealt uh, with the Jewish people. And Abraham's descendants have fared well um, in our country in America. And one of the main ways that we can continue to have God's blessing on our country is to do that. And I think that maybe in spite of all the moral rot that we have in our country, the one reason that we are still experiencing, at least in some measure, the good hand of God's blessing on our country is because of that, because of how uh, we've treated Abraham's descendants. That's the great statement of foreign policy in the Scripture. One other thing, though, that's important is to share the good news. God has a love for Israel, but he has a love for the nations of the world. Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who spread the good news. We don't often think of our feet being the most beautiful part of our body, do we? But the Bible says the feet of those who share the good news are beautiful. And America, in spite, again, of all the other problems that we've had, we have been uh, on the forefront of sending out missionaries to the world and telling people about Jesus Christ. And if the burden for God is the nation of Israel and the nations of this world, America, again, has fared fairly well 
in those two areas. But again, think about when the rapture takes place and all the Christians are taken out. What's going to happen? Our support for Israel will probably shrivel, go away, and our sharing of the good news obviously will go away as well, which will even further, I believe, God's just judgment uh, upon this country in which we live. But the final thing here is to practice and promote righteousness in our own lives. Um, I love what our brother, uh, what Brett had to say earlier. We're to live righteous lives ourselves. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. The wicked will return to Sheol, even all the nations uh, who forget God. Donald Gray Barnhouse used to say that when someone came and asked him a Bible prophecy question, he would always ask them, do you know 1 John 3.3? 3? And if they'd say no, then he'd say, I'm not going to answer your prophecy question. Because 1 John 3.3 3 says, everyone who fixes his hope on him purifies himself, even as he himself is pure. And he didn't want to answer their question and just give them more knowledge if they didn't really understand the purifying hope and the purifying effect of Bible prophecy in the life of a person. You know, it's one thing for us to decry all the sin in our country, but if you read uh, Isaiah chapter 5, six times you have the words, woe to the people, woe to them for their drunkenness, woe to them for their materialism, and over and over again. But when you get to Isaiah 6, it's woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. It's easy to decry the sin in our culture, but how often do we look at our own lives and decry our own sin? We can't expect our culture to be righteous and to live for the Lord and promote righteousness if we don't do that in our own lives. If we're addicted to pornography, if we're involved in sexual immorality, if our focus is on money and the things of this life, how can we hope to have a, a, a purifying effect in our own family and in our church and in this nation? We also need to pray for our country, and I pray you do that every day. I pray for this nation every day. The Bible tells us pray for those who are in authority that you can live godly and tranquil lives. We should do that each day. And then finally, anyone here who's not a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to take him to be your Savior. You need to accept Jesus Christ to be your Savior from sin. It's a great statement I heard a lot not long ago. A man said this. He said, you know, it's the most important thing is not that I accept Jesus to be my Savior, but it's that God accepts Jesus to be my Savior. You think about that for a moment. The greatest thing in the world is that God accepts his Son to be my Savior. God has accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on my behalf. He has accepted Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Now, it is incumbent upon me to accept that as well and to trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior from sin. I love that verse that says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus takes all my sin when I trust in him, and he gives me all of his righteousness. Now, you don't feel it. He credits all of the righteousness of Christ to my bank account, as it were, my heavenly bank account in, in, in heaven. Now, if you go to the bank uh, tomorrow mor morning or Monday morning and you put $500 in the bank, you won't feel that money go into your account. You, know, you won't kind of feel it go through the accounting process, but it's there, isn't it? And the Bible says that whenever we trust in Christ, God credits to our account in heaven the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. You trust him now, he takes away all your sin, and he credits that righteousness to you. And you stand before the holy God of this universe, clothed in the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite stories that's related to Bible prophecy is about uh, J.N. Darby. A lot of you have heard of John Nelson Darby. He's kind of the father of modern dispensationalism and the pre-trib rapture. And uh, J.N. Darby lived in light of the coming of Jesus Christ. And as J.N. Darby, when he died in 1881, as they were lowering his body down into the ground, one of his friends, William Kelly, quoted Darby's favorite song. And since I heard this a couple of years ago, it's gone through my mind over and over and over again. Think about that scene. He quotes these words, Savior, at thy feet I fall, my Lord, my life, my hope, my all, for I have nowhere else to flee, no sanctuary, Lord, but thee. Jesus Christ is our sanctuary. He is our refuge. And I pray that every one of us here have sought our refuge and our sanctuary in him alone. Let's pray together.
Father, we come before you now and we thank you so much for the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ could come back this very day. And I pray, Father, that we would be living in light of that purifying hope. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today who hears this message in any form who's never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that you would give them no peace, that they'd have no rest in their heart and in their life until they find that peace in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Father, we look forward to the coming of our Savior. We pray that it might come very, very soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.